So I'll tell you another mechanism to more efficiently utilize caches. That was one way of efficiently utilizing caches by figuring out which blocks should be inserted and should not be inserted into the cache or should be kept in the cache longer or shorter because eviction priority uh, tells you how long a block stays in the cache. Another mechanism is actually doing compressing data in the cache. And this is an idea that my student Gennady developed. Uh, and I, uh, uh, the, the idea is to have a very simple compression and decompression algorithm in the cache. And this is an area that has not been exa examined that much. So if you're interested in this, this is a very good area. Uh, even though lots of areas have been examined in caching, compression is one of the areas, at least general purpose compression, is an area that's not examined in detail. Instruction compression has been examined in detail, but data compression has been examined less. At least practical compression algorithms. So what is the problem? Off-chip memory latency is high. Large caches can help, but we don't want large caches because that has a lot of other issues. Compressing data in cache enables a larger cache at low cost. So we would like to do this. The problem is, whenever you compress data, you need to decompress it. And this decompression is on the execution critical path. And if your compression algorithm is not amenable to fast de decompression, you can actually degrade uh, performance. So we're going to target that problem. We're gonna, we, we would like to design a new compression scheme that has low decompression latency, low cost, obviously, and high compression ratio. So you could actually have low decompression latency. You could identify only the zero blocks and decompress them. Then you can actually have one bit to figure out whether, uh, how to decompress the block. But do, that doesn't get high compression ratio. So we'd like to get all of them at the same time. So the observation is that many cache blocks or cache lines have low dynamic range in the data they store. And the key idea is to encode these cache lines as a base, single base plus multiple differences of that base. And I'll give you this idea in more detail. The solution is base delta immediate compression. Now, this immediate compression will become more clear. Uh, that has low decompression latency and high decompression ratio. And it outperforms three state-of-the-art compression mechanisms that are not employed in caches because of the complexity and the decompression latency. So if you look at, uh, this is the general uh, uh, motivation for cache compression or any kind of compression. There's significant redundancy in data. If you look at a cache block, it may look like this, right? Uh, how can we uh, exploit this redundancy? We can compress the data in the cache. We can store this with much fewer bits. If you look at this, there's a lot of zeros. We don't need to store a lot of those zeros, right? This provides the effect of a larger cache without making the cache physically larger. A little bit background. If you look at this, uh, in an uncompressed cache, you basically get a cache hit, and the latency is quick because uh, you don't have something else sitting in between. Whereas if the compress, cache is compressed, you need to decompress a cache block on a cache hit, and that makes it slow. So this decompression latency is critical to performance, because L2 cache is on the critical path of execution. There are three key requirements in compression. One is this decompression needs to be fast. Second, it needs to be a simple mechanism so that we, don't uh, we avoid complex hardware changes. And third, it needs to be effective, of course. We need to get good compression ratio. And this is uh, designing a good compression algorithm is a trade-off between all of these three. So how do we try? Well, we're going to try to get the best of all three. We won't be perfect. But let's take a look at some previous mechanisms in terms of these three dimensions. If you have zero compression, the idea is if a cache block is zero, compress it. Otherwise, you don't compress it. Decompression latency is really fast, right? You have one bit saying cache block is zero or not zero. Complexity is nice. The compression ratio is not good. I'll show you. Uh, actually, it's surprisingly high, but it's not high. Uh, frequent value compression, basically, you identify what values are frequent in cache blocks and compress those accordingly. For example, if a cache block is 1, you identify that. If a cache, cache block has a value of minus 1 or all FFFFs, you identify those frequent values. Compression ratio turns out to be nice here, but the decompression latency is high because this leads to variable length cache blocks. And complexity also is high. Uh, frequent pattern compression, instead of identifying values, it identifies patterns. So it, uh, the cache block looks like this. A value and a mask repeated this way, for example. I'm not going to go into detail, but you can read the papers related to these algorithms. Uh, the decompression latency is, again, low. And I'll show you numbers provided by implementations of these previous papers. Uh, the latency is 5 to 10 cycles in, in both of these. Uh, uh, even in a non, uh, not aggressive processor. And if you make the processor more aggressive, this, this latency could go up to 20 cycles or so. 
in this case, complexity is not too bad, but uh, compression ratio uh, is good. So our proposal will hopefully achieve uh, best of all worlds. The, the compression latency will be much shorter than these two mechanisms. Complexity will be less, and compression ratio will be, actually, I think will be better. So what's the key idea? Uh, let's take a look at some data patterns in real applications. Uh, if, and I'm going to show you examples of cache blocks. Some cache blocks are all zeros, like this. This is a cache block, and this is, uh, I think, an eight byte value, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good. I d we didn't miss a zero here. <laughs> So you have eight eight byte values and a 64 byte cache block. So zero values are common because initialization, you initialize things to zero. You have sparse matrices, you have null pointers, they're all zeros, right? You have repeated values like this, all zeros FF. You can have common initial values, sentinels, adjacent pixels, for example, in a graphics application, adjacent pixels, maybe if the sky is blue and most of, the, uh, most of your screen is the sky, then adjacent pixels will all be the same or similar. And similar goes to these narrow values, potentially. Right? Narrow values means values are small, but they're different. Small and these result in small value, uh, these results, uh, these appear because you may have small values stored in a big data type. You declare an integer, an integer is four bytes, let's say, but you use only a very little part of it. You use it as a flag. And most programmers do this. Or dynamically, it may so happen that your integer values are small, right? And only some of them are large. You still need the large, value, large data type. Or this could happen because you have similar adjacent pixels, right? Not repeated adjacent pixels, but similar adjacent pixels. And there are also other more complicated patterns that look like this. They're not narrow. They're not repeated. They're not zero. But they're close to each other. And this happens when you store pointers, when you pack pointers in a data structure. In this case, these look like pointers, right? And they're similar. They're close to each other. They're pointing to similar locations. What's common in all of these is, uh, well, let's take a look at this. What's common in all of these is there's, the values are very close to each other. But we'll get back to that. So how common are these patterns first? We've done this study over a bunch of applications, I guess spec, uh, databases, web workloads, with a two megabyte L2 cache. This is the coverage of the cache lines. What fraction of the cache lines are zero? What fraction of the cache lines have the repeated values? And what fraction have these other patterns that we have? Uh, Surprisingly, about 20% of the cache contains zero. And in this application, the entire cache is zero, which is <laughs> interesting because it, it has actually sparse data values. Or maybe we selected a part of the application that's not the best. Uh, but this, this pattern is actually seen by other researchers that did zero compression also. Uh, and there are some repeated values which are not that high, but these are not also graphics applications. We see that this pattern different from in graphics applications. In many graphics applications, you see repeated values and other patterns. Uh, these are not graphics applications. Uh, and I don't have the results with them yet. Uh, not with me. Uh, other patterns are also common. If you look at some of these applications, uh, other patterns are common, like Hammer. I guess the closest to graphics application is this H264 ref. So that, that's a video encoder and decoder. And that has a lot of other patterns which may be uh, similar pixels. So 43 of the cache lines actually belong to these key patterns. Uh, what is the common characteristic of these key patterns? They have low dynamic range. Basically, differences between the values are significantly smaller than the values themselves, which means that we can encode these differences and not, not the full values. So that's the idea. The key idea is uh, to have a base plus delta encoding, and I'm going to uh, have a small uh, values over here. We have a 32 byte uncompressed cache line, and this is a four byte uh, value, and they're similar to each other as you see. We're going to take one of them as the base, and we're going to compute differences from that base. For this first element, it's the same. So we have, we have one byte difference, that's zero. We have another difference here, that's eight. Another difference, that's 10, hex 10. Now we can encode this 32 byte uncompressed cache line with 12 bytes only, because you have a single base and eight, uh, I guess, eight differences from that base. So that's the idea. You can save 20 bytes in this case. So what are the advantages of this? This is, the decompression of this is really fast, right? Because if you look at this, if you want to decompress this cache line, it's basically you take this base and add it in parallel to all of these differences, and you get the de uh, uncompressed cache line. This is basically a vector addition, single, uh, operation addition performed on multiple data elements. 
It has simple hardware because all you need is arithmetic and, arithmetic and compar comparison. You don't have variable length uh, compression within the cache block. And we'll, we'll show that this is effective. It has good compression ratio. And we'll take a look at that uh, next. But can we do better, first of all? Uh, in this case, we require only one uh, uh, differences from a single base. right? But what if you have values that are mixed? This doesn't handle that case. Maybe you want two bases, right? So can we do better tries to uh, and, uh, understand that question? This is an uncompressible cache line with the mechanism that I described earlier. If you have a single base, you cannot compress this, right? Because some of the elements are narrow values, some of the elements are pointers. So the key idea is to use more bases. So why don't you use two instead of one? If you have two bases, now you can actually encode this with two bases and differences from respective bases. The pro is more cache lines can be compressed. But there's a downside. One is, how do you actually find these bases efficiently? And the second is, it's higher overhead, because now you store mu multiple bases. But regardless, we did a study across all of these applications. What if you have multiple arbitrary bases? What, is a comp what happens to compression ratio? In this case, compression ratio means uh, 1 means a 1 megabyte cache appears as a 1 megabyte cache. 1.2 means a 1 megabyte cache appears as a 2 megabyte cache. And, uh, with one base, the compression ratio is 1.4. With two bases, compression ratio actually increases. With three bases, compression ratio reduces because now you're storing bases, right? That adds overhead. Uh, and with more bases, actually, compression ratio reduces. With 16 bases, your compression ratio is lower than with one base because the storage of the base o uh, overhead of bases increases significantly. So we found that this is the best point in space. Two bases is the best option based on these evaluations. Although three bases is a close second. But the problem still exists. How do you find that second base? The first base, we're going to assume that it's going to be the first non-zero element in the cache. This is the base plus data part. The second base, we found that having an implicit base of zero is a good idea. Because many cache blocks have uh, some values that are interspersed with narrow values. Zero covers both narrow values and zeros, right? and also similar uh, values that are close to zero. That's narrow values. So that's the immediate part. So that's the final mechanism. So there's an advantage of two arbitrary bases over here. We actually get better compression ratio. Why? Because if your second base is implicit as zero, then you don't need to store that second base. Right? You actually store a bit saying that whether your base is the first element or is it zero. And this also leads to simpler compression logic. So that's the idea of base delta immediate compression. One base is zero. The second base is determined as the first non-zero element. So let's take a look at the compression ratio with two arbitrary bases versus a base set to zero. In fact, if you look at this, if you look at the geometric mean, the compression ratio increases if the second base is zero instead of an arbitrary base, because you don't need to store that base. It's implicit. But there are some cases, of course, where the uh, arbitrary base is better than storing zero because in this application it turns out that uh, z zero values are not common, narrow values are not as common. Okay, so average compression ratio is close and sometimes worse, sometimes better, but base delta immediate is simpler. That's why we're going to go with that. So let's take a look at the implementation quickly. How do you design the decompressor? Uh, it, it needs to be low latency, and in this case we're going to ensure that. We actually have an RTL implementation. Uh, of this, and all of these seem to be true. Uh, the energy overheads are seem to be low also. Uh, so compressor design has low cost and low complexity, but this is usually not on the critical path. So this can be a little bit more complex than this. Uh, and cache organization is the tough part, because this needs to change the cache organization. And that's usually the problem when these things need to be implemented in a real processor, because this, this does change it. Whenever you want to compress cache, you need to change the organization of the cache. And we'll take a look at that. So what is the compressor design? This is, I'm not going to show the immediate part here, but basically this is your compressed cache line. We add a vector, uh, we have a vector adder. We take the base and add it to all of these immediate values, which gives us uh, the uncompressed cache line. And if you have a base delta immediate, basically you have a masked vector addition, right? You select uh, whether to add base zero or zero to the element. That's the idea. And that's relatively simple also. Compressor design is a little bit more complicated. If you get an uncompressed cache line from memory, uh, the question is, do you store it in a compressed form? 
And there are limited size of uh, compressed forms. So these are different compression units here. And these compression units uh, oh, basically uh, have a compression flag saying the cache line can be compressed with this compression unit. And they also provide the compressed cache line. So a 32-byte uncompressed cache line can be compressed as a zero cache line, as a repeated value cache line. Or it could have an 8-byte base 0, 1-byte delta. 8-byte base 0, 2-byte delta. And you can have all of these different combinations, right? Whatever you would like to support. And, and whatever hardware cost you can, uh, you can bite in the system. And eventually, there's a compression selection logic based on the size of the compressed uh, cache line. It picks the best compressor. compressor. And it either provides a compressed cache line, or it says the cache line cannot be compressed. That's the idea. So one unit looks like this, basically. This is the unit that uh, takes a 32-byte uncompressed cache line and looks for 8-byte bases and 1-byte deltas. Basically, we take each value. This is a vector subtraction now, right? Subtract each value from the base and get the deltas. And deltas are supposed to be 1 bytes. If the deltas are within 1-byte range, every delta is 1-byte range, then this is compressible. Right? Then we provide the cache line. And every unit provides this, one by one. No, no, we don't do that. Basically, to simplify the logic, we say it's not compressible. You can do better, perhaps, right? You can actually try to pick another base, but that's we don't do that, because that complicates the logic significantly. We say the base is the first non-zero element. Yes. That's All four of them is in one byte range, we compress it? Yes, otherwise we don't compress it. That's right, For this, with this unit. And all of the units do this and say, I can compress it or I cannot compress it. And eventually, if one of them can compress it, then we use, we use that uh, cache line with the lowest uh, size. So this is actually simple also because it's really a vector subtraction and a check of range check. It's not that simple, but it's simple compared to many other compression mechanisms. Uh, cache organization is, has the, uh, is the part that has the modest complexity. So if you have a conventional two-way cache with 32 byte cache lines, it looks like this. You basically have this kind of tag storage. You have for each set, you have two tags. And data storage is coupled with the tag storage. This tag says, this tag corresponds to this data. This tag corresponds to this data, and it's fixed data size, right? Now we cannot have fixed data size, right? Uh, what we would like to do is we don't want to, we want to have smaller cache blocks, and if we have smaller cache blocks, we can pack more data within the same amount of data storage. So we'd like to be able to support this somehow. Well, this is the baseline cache. So with base delta immediate compression, we would like to have a four-way cache with eight-byte segmented data. So First of all, we, we would like to store more cache blocks given the same amount, which means that we need to go after more tags. We cannot escape from that fact. So whenever you have a compressed cache, you need to have more tags than the baseline cache. So we're going to increase the size of the tag store so that we can store four cache blocks within the same storage. And we're going to change the organization of the data store. Well, in the tag store, we're going to also have compression encoding bits. Uh, the, the idea here is basically this tells you what kind of compression mechanism, which compressor actually compressed this block, right? Is it zero? Is it eight bytes bases with one byte deltas? Is it one of those? So you need some bits for that. And the data store changes now also. There's no decoupling, there's no coupling between the tags and data anymore. Now we, each tag specifies where the segment, uh, where this data starts and where it ends. So now we've segmented the tag data store and we can have pointers. This tag mapped to multiple adjacent tag segments. This tag, for example, is pointing to a cache block that is 24 bytes. It has a starting pointer. It starts from segment four, and it has three segments. And that's how you select it. And this is a change that needs to happen to the cache organization whenever you have a compressed cache. And it turns out this has 2.3% overhead for a two megabyte cache. And this is actually verified with uh, very log results. OK, any questions? So let's take a look at qualitative comparison with prior work. I already talked about this. But uh, there's been a lot of work on zero 
base cache has zero value, cache length, zero content, augmented cache. Basically, these try to compress only zero values, and they have limited applicability, as I showed. Frequent value cache based of compression has high decompression latency and complexity. And pattern based, actually, this is about 10 cycles or so uh, with low frequency designs. Pattern based compression designs, uh, they try to find frequent patterns, and they have high decompression latency. Five cycles may not sound that high, but this is the critical path of uh, the cache miss. If your L2 cache is 20 cycles, adding five cycles is really significant. Certainly, we're not going to do this for the L1 cache. The L1 cache, e even adding one or two cycles more, increases, it reduces your performance. And it's not clear if you would like to really more efficiently utilize your L1 cache. Maybe you do, but you don't want to. You don't want the. You don't want that to come at the cost of additional latency to the L1 cache. Uh, and uh, there are other algorithms that actually look like uh, try to implement this algorithm uh, at, at low complexity, and they, they show designs with eight cycle latencies. Let's take a look at the evaluation. So this is actually uh, event and simulator based on SIMIX. We generated tra traces using SIMIX and evaluated this mechanism. Uh, and I'll show you some results. These are with different parameters. Uh, this is the compression ratio comparison. Uh, this is a uh, compression ratio of zero caches, zero-based compression. You see that it's about 20%, uh, 1.2. Frequent value compression is lower than frequent pattern compression. And the compression ratio of base delta immediate is a little bit higher than frequent pattern compression. But it, it comes at uh, lower complexity. And the compression ratio is 1.53. So one megabyte cache looks like a 1.53 megabyte cache. Uh, let's take a look at the results in terms of performance improvement and miss reduction. This is, as you vary the size of the L2 cache, this is with single core. As you vary the L2, size, L2 cache size from 512 kilobytes to 16 megabytes, what kind of performance improvement you get. Uh, and this is also relative to everything is normalized to 512 kilobytes. So if you, you see that the performance improvement redu uh, is about 8% with 512 kilobytes, and it reduces mostly as you reduce the cache size. It doesn't always because uh, sometimes your replacement policy, of, uh, you, you get fragmentation in the cache when you compress the cache, right? And sometimes your replacement policy interacts interestingly. Uh, so if you look at this, uh, basically, rule of thumb is mostly base delta immediate compression achieves the performance of a 2x size cache. So this is base delta immediate compression, and that gets similar performance size uh, to a 2x size cache. In fact, in this case, it's better than a 2 employing compression with a two megabyte cache provides you better performance than a four megabyte cache without compression. And performance improves due to the decrease in misses. This is miss rate. MPKI is the misses per kilo instructions and miss rate reduces with compression. And the miss rate reduction varies depending on the cache size. Okay, let's take a look at multi-core workloads. In multi-core, this is more effective, of course. So we're gonna classify the workloads based on compressibility, uh, if, if a workload is compressible, if its effective cache size increases high with compression, otherwise it has low compressibility, and the sensitivity to cache size. Uh, sensitivity means uh, how sensitive is the performance of an application to the cache size. Uh, and some applications have no sensitivity. Uh, those are low sensitivity. Some applications have high sensitivity. You give them more cache, they will get more benefit. There are three classes of applications. Some of them are Low compressible, have low compressibility and low sensitivity. Some of them have high compressibility and low, sen low sensitivity. Some of them have high both, high compressibility and high sensitivity. Interestingly, among the applications mix we have examined, we don't have any low compressibility and high sensitivity applications. That's just luck, I think. Yes? Is this the trick of, I mean, if you're doing compression every time you're fetching, uh -huh. you are taking longer to get that fetch, right? But That's right. That's right. So in this case, we're assuming, uh, we, in the paper, we vary the latency. So we're assuming one to two cycle latency. That's right. And these, these take into account, the results that I showed you take into account those additional latency. So the baseline doesn't have that latency, but we add one to two cycle latency for every fetch. So if you make that zero, we gain even more performance improvement, but that's not realistic. So, so you're getting more improvement because you're storing more... Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
Exactly. Exactly, yes. I don't think I have it on this slide, but the paper discusses the latency sensitivity of compression also. And other mechanisms don't perform too well because they have longer latency. Even though they reduce the cache misses in a similar amount, they have longer latency to access the compressed data. And because that gets added to every fetch. And every exactly. Every, uh, every fetch of a compressed cache block, you're right. If, it's, if the cache block is not compressed, if you can figure that out quickly and supply the data. OK, so we have these two, three classes of applications, and we, we're going to look at two core results. We're going to have random mixes of each possible class pairs, and we're going to have 120 total workloads. This is the performance improvement. Uh, this is the normalized performance uh, compared to the baseline with no compression. And these are applications with low sensitivity here, paired up with applications with different compressibilities, and applications with high sensitivity here, paired up with applications with different uh, compressible these again. This is, the, this is the geometric mean. If you look at this, the performance improvement of base data imme delta immediate compression is the highest. It's about 10%. It's, there's no easy way to do these experiments. But uh, uh, if you look at frequent pattern compression, this is a much more complex mechanism, by the way. I think the complexity prevents these two mechanisms from being implemented. But uh, the performance improvement of this is lower. And the main re one of the main reasons is because of the additional latency. Because this, I think we gave it five cycle latency, whereas our latency is two cycle decompression. And if you look at this, the applications that have high sensitivity, uh, if at least one application is sensitive, then, the, then performance improves. So you need to have some sensitivity. And of course, some compressibility also. So those applications that have high sensitivity and high compressibility benefit most from compression. High sensitivity means sen it's sensitive to the cache size. So if an application is not sensitive to the cache size, you can compress another application and its performance will not improve. Or you can compress its blocks, but its performance will not improve because you're not reusing the cache. OK, there are a bunch of other results in the paper, and you can take a look at it also. Uh, and I think we've covered some of these. You can actually. You don't have to have 2x tags only, right? You can actually increase your tag store and store more cache blocks. And uh, you can get up to 1.98 average compression ratio if you, is you, if you increase the number of tags you can store. But that's bad because that increases complexity significantly. So 2x tags is probably a reasonable point, even if the compression ratio of one point is 1.53. Uh, there's also a bandwidth savings. Uh, there's this decrease of bandwidth. Uh, like a 2x decrease, more than 2x degrees in bandwidth. Uh, and there's a cost analysis also. Okay. I guess I'll conclude this quickly as well. Basically, uh, the key realization in this uh, work is that many cache lines can be efficiently represented using base plus delta encoding. And we have a hardware mechanism that can do this efficiently with high compression ratio, with high coverage. It has low latency decompression. It has simple hardware implementation. It improves cache hit ratio and performance of both single core and multi core workloads. And uh, the previous mechanisms that are interesting are not implemented in today's process. People have actually explored these mechanisms quite heavily in industry and in academia, and they've chosen not to implement explicitly because these are very high complexity. The hope is that this is low complexity enough that it will be implemented, but somebody needs to actually decide that they need to change the cache organization. That's the tough part. <laughs> if they decide to stick with the existing cache organization, you're never going to, going to be able to compress your cache, I think. But if someone has a good idea of compressing your cache with the existing cache organization, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> I think it's tough, though. Because if you cannot store more lines, how are you going to get, get, take advantage of compression, right? <laughs> I'm sorry? Isn't it cheaper just to add more cache That's true. So that's, that's actually, this, this result says that it's not as cheap, right? So if you actually, if you look at this, uh, a one megabyte cache with base delta immediate compression provides the performance of a two megabyte cache. So then the trade-off is, do you, do you add one more megabyte or do you add 2.3% additional overhead with some complexity? And if you look at this, a two megabyte cache with base delta immediate compression provides better performance than a four megabyte cache. So I think that's the trade-off. I think 
Uh, it is cheap, it's simple. It's simple to increase the size of your cache, but it does increase your latency also, right? That's, that's another a different latency increase. So in this case, actually, we kept the latency constant. How does yeah. the latency so if you increase the size of your cache, it's latency, read latency increases, right? Because it's a bigger structure now. So I think this is a better trade-off than just simply increasing the size of your cache. I've never liked the idea of just putting more cache onto the chip. It seems like <laughs> a cop-out, right? That's <laughs> but I think I, I realize the reasons for it, right? There are good reasons when you're implementing a processor, but I think we're beyond the point <laughs> now that we need to efficiently utilize all of these structures. Okay, should we take another break right now, or are we almost done? Okay, maybe this is a good time to take a break if it's uh, only five minutes, and we'll, we'll come back soon.